The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to give it one or two more minutes before we get started, just so we can get some more people um, um, actually enter into the website. All right, well, I think this is a good time to get started. Uh, my name is Sandra Vandenberg, and I'm the Associate Director at the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. And today's webinar is hosted by the Michael and Susan Dell Center, um, which is at the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin. And the center's mission is healthy children in a healthy world. And before we get started, I just um, want to make some housekeeping announcements. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived along with the presentation slides on our website at msdcenter.org. And then if you have any questions during the presentations, uh, please enter them into, your, into the questions chat box and we will have time for um, Q&A at the end of the presentation. However, if you have some more clarifying type questions, please go ahead and um, put those in the chat box as well. And we will kind of keep try to keep track of those during the presentations so, so that we can make sure that um, we can alert the presenter to those types of questions throughout. Um, let's see. So I would like to um, mention that this webinar is the first of a series. Um, and the series of webinars is called our food systems and food insecurity during COVID-19 stories from across the state. So we will have um, five different webinars. They will all be held on Tuesdays. Um, so for the next five, five Tuesdays, including this one, um, either at 11 or 12 o'clock, but we'll be sending out registrations um, throughout the weeks. And some of these will focus on the more national level, but then we have three specific webinars that will focus on um, Austin and Houston and then El Paso. So we hope that you're able to join um, all of our webinars. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Robert Maggiani, who is a sustainable agricultural specialist at the National Center of Appropriate Technology, um, where he's been for the past eight years or so. Then in previous positions, he worked at the Texas Department of Agriculture. Um, he will be presenting um, the webinar today called Food Systems Resiliency. Um, again, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. And other than that, I think we're ready to go. It's all yours, Robert. Well, thank you. I appreciate you all uh, working on us, working with us on this uh, webinar, and I hope it'll be a benefit to the folks who are listening. Um, if you would move to the next slide, please. Uh, if you'll notice, I did have on that first slide a question mark with the title Food System Resiliency. And so I'm hoping one of the things we'll do today is try to answer some of the questions that relate to that phrase, Food System Resiliency. But again, first, I want to just step into an introduction to what NCAT and ATRA. As Sandra mentioned, NCAT stands for National Center for Appropriate Technology. We are a private nonprofit corporation. We have uh, the central office in Butte, Montana. We have six other regional offices, one of which is located in San Antonio. That's our Southwest regional office. That's where I work. There's four other people in the Southwest office. Uh, NCAT was started back in the mid 70s as a reaction to the oil embargo. I know that the great majority of the folks listening don't remember that, but I remember it very well. It was very much a uh, disruptive change in our way of living when all of a sudden we couldn't get gasoline, or if you could get it, it was like literally three and four times the price overnight. So NCAT was formed as a reaction to that, and the, the choice of the term appropriate technology was specific, was on purpose. 
And if you look at that little diagram on the side, you can see uh, what we're talking about when we say appropriate technologies. These are re really some of what we call our first principles within NCAT. And you can see the, the first one on the top there is support resilient communities. We were talking about the idea of resiliency way back in the early 70s, mid 70s when NCAT started. The whole idea of trying to help communities uh, essentially get back up when, when the world knocked us down. And so that's what resiliency is about. Uh, the, if you, as you go across the right on, the, on that little diagram there, you can see some of the other aspects, some of the pillars that we talk about as we talk about using the concept of appropriate technology. Prioritize homegrown businesses, build local self-reliance, conserve energy, shift to a low-carbon low economy. Of course, that was, a, again, a reaction to the oil embargo. Strengthen, strengthen social cohesion adapt to disruptive change, the disruption that came about. Um, NCAT uh, was essentially an energy organization back then and in the mid 80s as the uh, ag crisis started hitting uh, conventional agriculture, NCAT decided to add a project that was called ATRA. And again, it deals with appropriate technology transfer to rural areas. And it essentially ATRA, which is the project that I work with under NCAT, became the extension service for farmers and ranchers who really were in, interested in getting involved in sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture. And now we're using the term more often uh, regenerative agriculture. And so NCAT kind of birthed ATRA as a, a way of applying appropriate technology lenses to agriculture. So if you could do the next slide, please, Sandra. Okay, so we're gonna ask the, the first part of the question, what does a food system look like? And we're gonna look at this little diagram here to try to do our best to cut through some of the complexity. Food systems are incredibly complex. They're multi-layered. They involve a lot of different actors and a lot doing a lot of different things. So we're gonna try to make it a little bit simple and just uh, talk about five or six different elements that are part of a food system. And you can see it starts with food production. That seems to be obvious. Where uh, crops and and animals and the actual production of the food is done. That's that's on the farms and the ranches, not only of Texas but all across the country. And that's really the area that we as ATRA employees mostly deal with. Three fourths of our conversations take place with farmers and ranchers as we try to help them. Uh, become more successful at what they do by using those appropriate technology applications that we just talked about to farming and ranching. And so as you go across the different elements here, you, you can see that there's arrows pointing to each of them. That's a way of trying to indicate that there are feedback loops going on. Uh, it's not to imply that the distribution and aggregation segment doesn't deal with the segment called preparation and consumption. Clearly it does, but it's just a, trying, a way of trying to show that there are different elements of the food system and there are different actors within each element. Now, sometimes the actors actually play in more than one element. For example, farmers and ranchers who are in the food production element can also become players in the food processing element as they uh, get involved in what we call value-added products. And that, for example, a farmer and a rancher might grow tomatoes and, and peppers and decide to get into the hot sauce business. So now he or she is also in the food processing sector. And so you can, as you could envision, if you could close your eyes and envision all of the ways that you see just as you go about your daily life, the food system doing its thing. If you, if, you talk, if you look at the distribution and aggregation segment, you can imagine all the trucks running up and down the highways in Texas that you see all the time. The Labatt trucks, the Cisco trucks, the Benny Keith trucks, that's that sector of the food system. The food processing is clearly just what it says. You know, the Frito-Lay companies of the world, 
in Austin, it could be the Michelangelo, the, the uh, Italian food processor in Austin. They're, they're everywhere in Texas. Um, there's thousands of them. But essentially, they take the food that's produced on the farm and, and use it as ingredients and create other food products. Marketing is more the companies themselves, the brands that you think of, all of the different food brands, Frito-Lay being one, Coca-Cola being one. Uh, you know, there's thousands of them. That's the marketing part of the food system. Markets and purchasing, that's really the retail grocery stores, the restaurants, the hospitals, the schools. That's where the foods really go to get to the next part of the chain there which is a preparation and consumption. That's us, that's us as consumers. And that's where a lot of y'all as, as health um, advisors, health specialists also are involved in maybe as nutritionists or dietitians or in, in other ways of trying to help us as consumers, just as folks uh, creating, using our food in healthy ways. And then the, the last one, which is, oftentimes overlook, overlook the resource and waste recovery section of the food system. It's uh, recycling food, it's recycling containers, it's reusing raw materials that help us go back into food production. It could be composting, for example. That's a fairly easy way to see how waste recovery goes back into food production. So that's a simple way of looking at a food system, but I think we can all relate to it. We, we have a, a gut feel for what, what a food system is. And really, as we'll talk through this presentation, we'll see that there really are more than one food system, um, particularly as it relates to the markets and purchasing sector. You can see that um, there's really a major break as to where food originates on the farms and goes into what we call the retail sector, not only to grocery stores, but it could be to farmers markets, it could be to you know, a lot of the home meal delivery companies that are are uh, coming into being now. That's the retail sector. The other part of the sector there is the food service. We talked about restaurants, hospitals, hotels, schools, um, you know, food that's consumed off-site, not at home. Two major uh, breaks or different aspects of the food system. But it's all part of the same thing. Food is, is uh, produced on farms. It gets to places that add value to it. We eat it, and then it just keeps on going. So that's the food system. All right, can we do the next slide, please? And so now we're going to talk about what is food system resilience. This is, a, this is our way of looking at uh, what we call regional food networks. And you could call them local food systems if you want. We typically use the term food networks because when you add them all up, then they become the food system, a regional food system. So that deals with the connectedness of all the different actors that we just talked about. And so you can see our hypothesis that we, we kind of work from within ATRA is that more integrated regional food networks will improve and enhance the long-term opportunities for entrepreneurship and innovation. Those are two of the things that we really try to promote, entrepreneurship, innovation. Again, as you saw in that diagram of appropriate technology, the, the focusing on local self-reliance. Um, that's essentially what that means is creating thousands and thousands of small businesses who do what a community needs them to do. And specifically as it, as it relates to the resilience of that system, look over on the, on the last uh, column on the right, you can see that the resilience refers to the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to essentially have the same function, structure, identity. Again, that's the picking yourself back up after life has knocked you down. And so look at all the different activities that are going on at the same time as a food system tries to redo itself. It's absorbing disturbance, it's reorganizing, it's retaining its functions, it's uh, communicating through all of these feedback loops. So all of this is going on at the same time that a, that a food system is trying to right itself after it's taken a big hit. And certainly what the, the hit that our food systems, and again, I'll say plural, 
have taken from COVID-19 is, is truly unprecedented. And so we're here in a, in a world in June 2020 that who would have ever thought would have existed six months ago, much less a year ago. But here we are, our food systems, our local food system is trying to be resilient. And I must say, a lot of the people that we work with, uh, the food banks, the nonprofits, the farmers, the home deliveries, the, the restaurants who have you know, shifted to become a mini store, the, their resilience is just uh, amazing and um, something that we should really honor and respect. And so resilience is the ability essentially to get back up and get back in business. And so if you would go to the next slide, please. We're gonna answer another question that relates to the topic. How much does it cost? We've talked about what is, what is a food system? What does the resilience of that food system look, look like a little bit? And so to me, it seemed like the next question we might ask ourselves, well, that's interesting. How much does it cost? And as Sandra mentioned earlier, we're gonna be, you know, this whole series of webinars is gonna be about storytelling. And so we're going to look at a way of trying to answer this question today here briefly with five or six different slides that kind of start telling different stories of different segments of the food system as it relates to that question, how much does it cost? And I want to encourage all of us to be able to deal with some paradoxes and some seeming contradictions that are going to come up as we start telling these stories and as we start looking at what's really happening as we see these headlines. You can see that these, the way I'm gonna present these stories are actually headlines that come out of different blogs or different or, uh, newsletters or different articles that we typically read at ATRA as we try to learn what's going on in the food system. So this is a story. Let's look at this first story here. Something isn't right. U.S. probes soaring beef prices. Well, I think uh, our typically an individual's first reaction to that headline is that that's something negative. Uh oh, that's bad. Beef prices are going up. That's bad. Well, let's think about that. Uh, mo again, most of y'all, I'm assuming, are in the health sector. Uh, you're probably very aware that the fact that uh, Americans, the uh, typical Western diet, is uh, very much uh, involved with probably uh, safe to say too much animal protein. And so maybe the fact that beef prices are going up and that that might encourage some of us to eat a little less beef, maybe that's not a negative. And so there's that first contradiction that I want us to try to really look at. I, I think contradictions and, and trying to deal with paradoxes help us really uh, break down what's really happening and get into a little bit more detail. So this story right here, this headline, something is right, probe soaring beef prices, was probably meant to uh, create a negative impression in the people reading this headline. But I'm not sure that it's something that would be particularly negative, although it is true. Uh, if, you, if you look at the statistics, Retail beef prices are going dramatically up, but at the same time, prices to cattlemen and cattlewomen have not gone up. They've actually gone down. And so we'll look at another headline here in a minute that deals with that issue. But so soaring beef prices are not necessarily good, not necessarily bad. It's just a fact. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. School lunch programs are losing millions feeding hungry kids. They could be broke by fall. If you look at the date on when this headline came out, May 31st, that was about oh, 10 days ago. Uh, uh, first of all, let me back up and say the, the folks who work in school food service have done an amazing service to us as a community. Not only in New Braunfels where, where I live, where my family lives, but all over Texas, you probably, each of us have probably read many stories about the amazing work that school food service personnel have done over the last two or three months to, to keep kids fed. It's just amazing what they've done and, and they deserve to be applauded for what they've done. 
but let's look at maybe some of the detail to this. Uh, 10 days ago, this headline came out. I saw a headline two days ago that estimated that just in Texas, school food service has lost probably a billion dollars. How much does it cost to do what's going on? A billion dollar school food service in the last three months has lost. That's a lot of money. And so what are gonna be the ramifications of that? What's gonna happen next school year? Well, it's hard to predict, but you know, most school districts in Texas do not subsidize their feeding operation. They have to stand on their own. So they have to charge prices. You know, essentially in every city throughout Texas, the schools run the biggest restaurant in the city, the biggest restaurant chain in the city. And so they have to stand on their own. And so if they've lost a billion dollars in the last three months, where does that put them to start uh, the next school year? Uh, you can be sure that a lot of hard conversations are going on right now as we're sitting here today at school food service operations trying to figure out what in the world are they going to try to do now that they've, in a, in a sense, gotten through the first wave of the issues of school feeding. A billion dollars. How much does it cost? Next slide, please. Why COVID-19 plant shutdowns could make the big four meat packers even more profitable. You've probably seen some of the headlines of uh, the major meat packers having uh, outbreaks of COVID. You saw that one uh, plant up in South Dakota that, I don't, and that has like 4,000 workers that had to shut down. Uh, there's other major plants in Nebraska that have had to shut down. Um, what that headline means is that Interestingly enough, even though some of the big uh, meat packers have had to shut their plants down, what that has done is jam up the flow of animals that have been flowing through to them. They're, they're not using them. The farmers who own those animals are having to figure out what to do with them. They're having to feed them longer. They're having to try to find places to sell them. And so what that's done to their marketplace is it's reduced the dollars per head that they get for a live animal. And in a sense, the uh, cattle raisers, the, the hog farmers, the chicken farmers, all of them are now actually making less money than they were before uh, COVID-19 really came into effect because the, the flow through of all the animals going to places like you see in this picture here, kind of jammed itself up. And so even though the big four meat packers, which is what, Cargill, Tyson, JBS, and I think IBP, Iowa beef packers, um, they may actually make more money because they, they're raising their prices that they're selling their product to retailers because they're having to spend more for uh, worker protection and doing you know, more sa uh, food safety, et cetera. So they're actually um, coming out more profitable out of this COVID-19 situation than they were before. Interesting paradox. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here's a couple of things that I thought were interesting. They're not really mainstream. Uh, but look at this headline on the left. Once thriving craft beer industry dealt crippling blow by kind of coronavirus. Well, that's a bummer. We all like brew pubs and craft beer. And, you know, over the last four or five years, that's really been a, an exciting almost growth industry here in Texas, for sure. I'm sure I'm assuming it has been around the country. But certainly in Texas, you, you've all seen the, you know, the feel good stories of, of local craft brewers who have come into being. And so now, uh, unfortunately, they're, they're not going to be doing as well. This is one part of the food chain that's uh, not doing well because for a couple of reasons, the brew pubs and the tap rooms had to close because they couldn't, you know, it's like a restaurant. They couldn't have consumers. Uh, you notice the other part of that headline, consumers less willing to experiment. So now the, the big legacy brands of beers if you read their, um, if you read the food industry publications, 
they're assuming the Budweiser, the Miller Lite, the Coors, they're assuming that most people are going to go back to buying their products now. So there's going to be in the retail stores, if you, if you keep for, you know, following that line of thought, there's going to be less room on the shelves in the retail stores for the little brands, the, lo the local brands that a lot of people, you know, might have one or two fronts in the beer section. Well, all of a sudden, those one or two fronts for the local beers are going away, and they're going to be refilled with Coors and Miller Lite and, and Budweiser. That, you know, that's not an earth-shattering development, but it is going to have a big play for the craft beer industry. Look at the next headline. It's something that we probably don't think about here in Texas. Bristol Bay, Alaska, locals fear COVID-19 along with 12,000 temporary salmon workers. Who, who would have thought about that issue, that aspect of the COVID-19 situation? All of a sudden the salmon industry, where that happens in, in the geography of, of Alaska, all of a sudden now they're worried about whether they should be even opening the salmon canning factories or the salmon uh, freezing places where they send salmon out to uh, grocery stores around the country. What happens uh, if they don't? Well, we can be pretty sure that salmon prices here in Texas are going to go up because there won't be much salmon. So that's, a, that's something that we, didn't, we wouldn't normally see unless you read the, the industry publications. Um, you could make the analogous situation what happens with uh, temporary ag workers who come to pick crops in South Texas or in Colorado, for example, where there's really a, a big uh, input of temporary workers when their uh, produce season comes into play, which is late summer. What are they going to do? Are they worried about 12,000 farm workers coming into Colorado? Probably. Go to the next slide, please. Um, let's look at the, the headline on the left. UNFI CEO, the recession could last 24 months. UNFI stands for United Natural Foods Incorporated. It's the largest natural foods wholesaler in the country. Uh, they probably have, I don't know, 20 billion or so dollars annual uh, revenue. They probably uh, employ maybe 20,000 people. They have warehouses all over the country. They have a big warehouse in the Dallas area. They are the biggest by far natural foods uh, wholesaler in the country. And, and their CEO, you can be for sure that he or she really has their hands on the, the pulse of what's happening, particularly in the, in the natural and organic food part of the food system. They, they expect the, the recession to last two months. I mean, I'm sorry, two years. Uh, just think of all the ramifications of that. Less people working, uh, less people buying other things. It just you know, has a, uh, a domino effect on everything if the recession it does really last for two years. Uh, restaurants are just now opening. Um, the unemployment rate is... You know, was listed last week. I think it came out as a listing 13 percent. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I think that was a, a dramatic underestimate of what the unemployment really is. When you add all the folks who really are working part time who want to work full time, so it's uh, you know the food system is not nearly out of this disruptive uh, series of events that's happening. And you can see that the folks who are really in the forefront of knowing what's happening or guessing that it's gonna last for a couple of years. Uh, let's look at the uh, headline on the right. Down, 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 rural bankers, economic confidence sinks. So not only is the, the selling side of the food system uh, a little bit uh, worried, the bankers who uh, finance conventional agriculture uh, when I say conventional agriculture, I'm talking about the, the corn farmers, the, the soybean growers, the cotton growers, the wheat farmers, the big, uh, the big eight crops that are subsidized by USDA. That's, that's the main rural, I mean, that's the rural uh, lifeblood in this country. The bankers are dramatically worried. If you look at corn, for example, 
you know, we're the U.S. is the biggest producer of corn in the world by far. Corn prices are probably, uh, I think the last price that I saw was like $3.30 a bushel for U.S. number two yellow corn. Uh, a year ago, they were $4.50 a bushel. Two years ago, they were 550 a bushel. Three years ago, it was 650 a bushel. So literally corn on the, on the open marketplace now is worth half of what it was three years ago when things were rocking along well for corn farmers who, who are really soybean farmers also because they rotate every other year. So the bankers are telling us by this headline that they're dramatically worried that the farmers in conventional ag, big conventional ag are not doing well. And, and you can imagine what that means for rural Americans uh, all across the, the school districts, the uh, main street in rural America, they're, they're, they're suffering, they're hurting. And so this is another indicator, this is another story, another way of looking at uh, one of the actors, the, the food production uh, player, in the food system is not doing well. And so it's something that we need to, our policymakers need to be concerned with, and they have been. USDA has been amazingly active. I won't say that they've done everything right, but they've, I've been impressed with their ability and their desire to try to uh, react to some of the situations as it relates to farmers, not only uh, specialty crop farmers, uh, but conventional grain farmers also have done a, a really, in my opinion, impressive job trying to help them. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, we have one more set of headlines to look at. Again, dealing with a story, how much does it cost? Look at the online grocery sales. You might think that this, this is really a positive, uh, in my opinion, headline, online grocery sales to grow 40%. Well, that's an interesting way now because that impacts farmers who are now trying to sell a lot of their products online because farmers markets took a hit. Their sales to grocery stores uh, almost fell off the cliff in, back in March and April. And so a lot of farmers have had to pivot and try to create online stores uh, to sell their uh, produce. Uh, a lot of other companies have grown their capacity. Uh, Imperfect Foods, you're probably aware of that as an online retailer. Uh, Blue Apron. Blue Apron, two years ago, a year ago, was uh, in danger of closing, and now their sales have dramatically improved. Whether that's going to continue in the future, we don't know. Um, we're guessing that um, that the, instead of maybe the seven or eight or nine percent of people who order regularly online, that's probably going to stay up in the 15 to 20 percent of people who are going to be regular uh, online food orderers now. So that is a major impact. But online grocery store uh, grow 40 percent. Let's see what, is, what does that mean to retail grocery stores? Well, that means they're going to be selling less product. What does that mean? That means they're probably going to be downsizing some of their store. A lot of them are going to be changed into what they call dark stores that they're going to use only as almost like mini warehouses, mini distribution centers. So that, that means they're going to be reducing their shelf space, which again might mean that a lot of the um, craft products, craft brands that we're used to seeing in the grocery stores won't be there next year because the local brands uh, won't be able to pay the price to retain that shelf space. Only the major legacy brands like Kraft and again, like Frito and a lot, uh, Heinz and all of those legacy brands, they're gonna be taking up more of the shelf space than they are taking up now. So all of these headlines have implications, further implications that you might not think of unless you really start contemplating the complexity of what is a food system and what happens in one part of the food system uh, when another part is impacted because of all of the feedback loops and how does that really help you answer the question 
how much does it cost? The last headline I want to look at relates to Driscoll. They're probably the largest uh, berry producer in the country, one of the few brands that most of us recognize in, in from as far as fresh, fresh produce comes about. Uh, Driscoll probably sells, I don't know, $2 billion a year worth of berries. Uh, you can see that they're, they're a little bit negative. They're worried that the market is just not there, that the retail grocery store is not going to be selling as many berries as they were. Uh, berries are hard to sell online because they're so perishable. Uh, every time you go uh, from a set of hands to another with berries, you lose a great percentage of the berries. So their Driscoll is worried about uh, retail grocery stores not being able to sell enough of their berries. What, do, what does that mean? Well, that means they're going to be employing less farm workers. Less farm workers means that they're going to have uh, difficulty in their local community because they're not going to be working. All of these headlines give you a main story, but when you really think about them, they have major impacts down through the food system. So that's really why I wanted to look at a few of these stories to try to help us entertain the question, how much does it cost? Next slide, please. Okay, now I want to try to answer one more question with you all, if I can. How do we get food system resilient? So we've talked about what is it, how much does it cost, and now we're going to try to answer the question, well, how do we get it? And so I just want to consider a, a few things before we get to the, to the trying to answer the question. But remember that our efforts and behaviors affect the food systems at different levels. So we have individual behavior, and we'll talk about that here in a minute about how we as individuals can um, do things that will affect the food system. And, and, and as we relate to individuals, we have to keep in mind there's a feedback loop, but consumer behaviors essentially drive producer behaviors. Now that's not to say that that's always the case because producer behaviors drive consumer behaviors on the next cycle of the feedback loop. But essentially, the consumers are in charge and the, and the producers and the retailers and the, everybody in the middle really try to do what us as consumers, what we, the signals that we give the system. So we're, I want us to keep that in mind. We as individuals, we do have more agency than oftentimes we think. Uh, so there are individual behaviors and there are collective behaviors. Collective behaviors have cultural aspects and they also have political aspects and have public policy uh, ramifications. So um, let's just keep that in mind. We're, we're, we're acting as individuals, but we're also going to be acting as part of a collective. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to do a little uh, shout out to producers. Uh, producers are individuals. Uh, there's probably not many producers on the uh, audience today, but I do want to uh, you know, that's who we really at, at ATRA, that's our main focus as producers. And I do want to just remind us that, remind the producers, and whether that's a crop farmer or an animal raiser or a value added uh, processor, uh, some of the first principles that we, that we at ATRA try to remind our producers that we should be doing as part of our individual behavior as producers. We should be following regenerative agricultural practices. We should be uh, engaging in advanced food safety protocols, and we should be transparent and honest in our marketing strategies. Those are some of the first pillars that we try to uh, convey to our when we work with producers. And we also want producers to recognize that they're also consumers and citizens who need to act to influence change in the food system. So all of us producers, let's keep in mind that we're also, we have different hats. We're also consumers and we're also citizens. So the next slide, please. So for, the, so for the rest of us who are not producers, we're also consumers and citizens. And we wanna keep in mind that we all eat. We can all organize and vote. We all have agency. And so if we want regionally focused, resilient food system made up of hundreds of small diversified actors and you saw the food system diagram 
that we talked about earlier. Um, we must be mindful when we buy our food. We must pay attention to what signals our purchases give to producers, retailers, restaurants, and policymakers. As we talked about in the previous slide, really uh, everything kind of starts with what we do as consumers. And so we as consumers, when we have our consumer hat on, all of us should be mindful when we uh, carry out the role of a consumer. This is a habit we can develop and improve. It's a habit. It becomes a habit or it can become a habit. And, and the last thing I want us to keep in mind is that the need for this mindfulness will probably never go away. So we must not give up on practicing it. I know I, oftentimes I'll say to myself, boy, maybe I shouldn't be buying this brand. I should be buying a brand that has a, a Go Texan logo on it. You know, I talked about having, or Simon introduced me as being an ex-employee of the Texas Department of Agriculture. TDA spends a lot of energy trying to remind folks here in Texas of what are the local products and what we would like to try to uh, encourage you to buy. And so, you know, we, we always have a decision to make and, and we, we always can come back to ground uh, zero and say to ourselves, okay, I'm, I'm now gonna start paying more attention to the way I spend my money and buying local products, buying, uh, buying through companies that will give us a resilient food system because they are local and because they are small and because when the national chains break, they won't be as affected. So this is something we can always come back to and never say, oh, well, it's, I forgot. And so I guess I'm, I'm just never going to do it. No, it's always day one. So as a consumer, we can always get better. We can always do it right and by being mindful. And so, and so let's keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Uh, so now let's step up to the, the aspect of collective behaviors. We know our collective behaviors can cause structural changes and they have public policy ramifications. And so let's think about what's happening now in this situation with COVID-19. Um, before COVID-19 was really the, the thing that was driving our way of dealing with uh, almost everything, we had a situation in our country, uh, I'm gonna be talking about now more, more or less the, the health uh, sector that, that I think the audience is involved in. We had diseases that are, that are chronic, they weren't contagious. You know what I'm talking about, uh, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, all of those diseases that were, we have a lot of people who are, are sick, let's be honest, in, in our country. But the diseases weren't contagious, they're chronic. And so our, our, our rule makers or our, our, our policy makers uh, essentially have, in my opinion, let business managers make the decisions first about the way our society is run. And then public health officials, much of y'all, public policy officials, deal with the damage. We call this, or I call this, a business in all policies ideology. And we'll talk about something that's a little bit different here and then I think will resonate more with y'all here in a minute. This is a norm in this country. But the COVID-19 situation has brought public health officials and medical officials to the forefront of government decision-making. This is not the norm. But the fact is the difference being, it's not that we have really that many more sick people, it's that the sickness is contagious. And so the, the business as usual aspect of our policy decisions has, has been temporarily set aside. The business and all policy ideology has been uh, kind of over, overwritten. What, what, what might happen, and so I'd like to kind of bring the question to the discussion here, what might happen if we could do that in our public policy making um, as a way of that, that it would be the norm. So let's go to the next slide, please. 
So I, I'm not, you know, saying anything that's new to y'all when I say health is a much broader concept than just health care. Y'all all know that. Y'all are that's the that's the business y'all are in. But what would happen if we could have a ideology that that was really really the leading ideology in our public policy making of something that's called health in all policies. This is a this is a way of, of looking at things that I saw from a, a gentleman in, in uh, Canada. His name is Wayne Roberts. And so I borrowed from his discussion about this this putting the ide ideology of health in all policies in the forefront of our public policy making. So health is a much broader concept than just just health care. What might putting this ideology of health in all policies, how might that impact our decision making as it relates to our food system? If you could get, go to the next slide, please. Let's look at, at a couple of aspects of our food system and see how this might impact us. Let's look at transportation. We all know that we have a, a, a long distance food system right now. Most food travels thousands of miles from the farm to the plate. We've all seen the statistics of, of 1,500 miles, 2,000 miles. Food comes from a long way away, typically because we're, we're not really, in my opinion, mindful of creating uh, a food system where most food is sourced locally. But what happens when we have this long uh, distance food system? It causes a great amount of air pollution. It contributes a, to a lot of traffic accidents. Um, air pollution is a, is a leading cause of premature death and, and a lot of chronic upper respiratory diseases that are prevalent in our communities. What, hap what would happen though if we had a health in all policies perspective come to the forefront as it relates to transportation policies? The easiest way to reduce transportation damage to our health is to have is to reduce food miles, which really means to promote and incentivize local food system, local food production. Next slide, please. Let's look at water pollution. Think about the health problems of water pollution. One of the major problems is the runoff of farm chemicals that were applied to fields, but were not used by the crops being grown. You can see that picture on the left. Um, again, back in conventional ag, um, agriculture, a, a lot of the ways that they, uh, that farmers are advised to grow uh, all the millions of acres of corn and soybean and cotton is to say, uh, we need to maximize production because that's what USDA policies incentivize. And the way you do that is you pour on a lot of synthetic fertilizers, mostly nitrogen, into your fields to see if you can get, uh, instead of 200 bushels of corn per acre, maybe if you spend another $50 an acre on extra nitrogen fertilizer, you can get 250 bushels of corn an acre. And theoretically, you'll make more money. Well, oftentimes that doesn't work that way. The nitrogen fertilizer doesn't, that's applied doesn't get used by the crop and it runs off when the rains come. And so we've all seen the stories of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. It's thousands and thousands of square miles. It is a direct result of excess nitrogen coming from the heart, you know, the breadbasket of America flowing down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. It's ag chemicals that were applied but not used by the crops. Over fertilization. Uh, look at this next picture over here, manure overflows. Uh, an another ag related source of water pollution is the overflow of manure from large scale livestock confinement structures, whether that's feedlots, or whether that's a uh, big uh, animal confinement at the farm. Um, when, you, when you confine that many animals together and you have uh, rain and you have uh, floods, this is what you get. But if you had ag policies, a health in all policies perspective 
on ag production policies and policies that we are we think are more in align with what ATRA first principles are, you could avoid these situations from happening because you wouldn't have to try to mitigate them. You wouldn't over fertilize your crops to begin with. You wouldn't confine all your animals in these huge confinement operations of thousands of animals at one time. You just wouldn't do it because you would have a health and all policies perspective. Let's do one more, let's look at one more slide, please, as it relates to this. Public feeding policies. Uh, you can see on the left, you have a, a, an image of a hospital or a nursing home, public school meals. Uh, if you had a health and all policies perspectives from the purchasing side, the purchasing aspect of uh, public um, decision making, you would have a, a lens that led policymakers to buy food from local and regional suppliers in season when it's the most nutritious and it's the cheapest. So um, again, this is another aspect of looking at, if you had a health and all policies perspective from running food systems. Um, okay, if I might show you the last slide here real quick. This is just some resources. Uh, you can see the first web page is our COVID page. The ATRA has a, a, a nice uh, website that I would encourage all of y'all to look at. We do have a a specific COVID page now, which uh, again is geared toward farmers and ranchers, trying to help them deal with the situation that has come about with COVID. If I might show you the the, the side of the next link there, uh, Sandra, please. You can see this is our local food systems page. You can see it's broken down into different subsect sections of uh, local food systems. We have direct marketing options, farmed institution, farmers markets, food policy, food hubs, uh, urban and community agriculture, um, all the different aspects that make up part uh, of the local food system. Why local food? You can see all our different publications. Um, it is a very extensive uh, way to help farmers and ranchers uh, hopefully guide their way through the decisions that they'll be making as it relates to local food. We might go back to the slide, please. Um, the other resource, that first link there that I, I'm showing you is a, an, a recent article by Michael Pollan. He is an, he's an author that I particularly enjoy. I like the way he approaches his analyses. And uh, you can certainly go to that uh, article right there and you can see his take on how you relate uh, food systems and, and public health also. This last resource, I want to show you the web page quickly. Um, it's a new web page that I just saw. Uh, it's called a plantrician instead of a physician. And you can see the definition there. A, a plantrician is a physician uh, empowered with knowledge of the benefits of whole food plant-based nutrition. You know, it's, it's amazing to me that our doctors, our medical professionals have almost no training in nutrition and they have no, um, I'll just say, they have no real respect for what nutrition can do as a, as a, as a way of empowering uh, health. And so I think this is an interesting website that, it just, that I just became aware of that I'd like to uh, encourage you all to take a look at as it relates to what we've been trying to do here all morning is how do how does the agriculture world and the health world, how do, the, how do we kind of get together and help each other out? And I think the interface of those two worlds, the ag world where I really work and, and deal in and the health world where y'all deal in, the food system is the interface of those two worlds. And I think the more that, that you know about the food system, what are the different actors? How do they relate to each other? How can farmers and ranchers uh, play a role in helping the food system uh, provide better products that help our help us as consumers, as community members, have better health? I think the better off we'll be. So um, that's really all I have to say. I don't know if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask. 
Thank you, Robert. Um, we will go ahead and take some time for questions. We have a couple minutes left. Um, so if you have a question, just make sure you type your question into the chat box. Um, in the meantime, I have a question, Robert. <laughs> so very practical. As a consumer, you know, how do you know that a pro or if a product supports a resilient food system? I mean, you mentioned the Go, Lo Go Texas logo or Go Texan logo. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other ways that consumers can, um, I guess, become more knowledgeable about where their food is coming from? You know, I, I, my opinion is it's it's not easy. It, it's part of being mindful. You're just going to have to do some research. Um, certainly, you could uh, ask us, ask me, or ask ask our coworkers, or ask any of our Atra. Um, my coworkers, what we think about a particular food product and whether we think their production practices are are sustainable or regenerative. Um, I think you just have to do the research. The, the advertising or the marketing that goes on for most food products um, does, is not really very clear on that in my mind. Now, certainly certified uh, organic products, that's one way you can you can be fairly confident that the production practices that are used are at least, uh, in my opinion, more uh, easy on, uh, on Mother Nature than typically conventional ag production practices. Uh, but you, I think the answer is you just have to do the research. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I see a question here, um, who is promoting this, the chemical companies? Um, no, the answer, uh, definitely not, in my opinion, the, the chemical companies. Um, we are, we're trying to promote this webinar as a way, in my opinion, as a way of understanding how the food system operates and how it might be used as a way of, of um, helping the general health of our community that was uh that's the way i would answer that question okay i see another question uh, are the effects of food system on climate change important to the atra approach uh, very much so um, we think uh, our our way atra the way that we try to promote uh or encourage producers to use as they grow their their food and their and raise their animals are very much in tune with reducing uh, the impact of agriculture on climate change. Um, that's another reason why we've started uh, ad adopting the term regenerative agriculture rather than sustainable agriculture, because regenerative agricultures actually help reduce the damage uh, to what's going on in our general production practices, not only in agriculture, but in in all in every other sector. For example, um, when you when you farm using regenerative ag uh, production practices, you can actually uh, take carbon out of the air and sink it into the ground and keep it into the ground. And so, if we could do that at scale, we could have a major impact on uh, global warming. And Robert, um, I think we are running out of time. <laughs> I know there's still other questions, but we will take all these questions and make sure they get answered. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for attending this webinar and I thank you, Robert, for this really very informative session. And I'm, you know, I personally feel that health in all policies is, you know, an ideology that we should all strive for. Um, so thank you. And um, Remember, um, we will have we have recorded this webinar, so we can um, we will archive it on our website at msdcenter.org. And then please join us next week for our next webinar, which will focus on um, food insecurity in Austin. We'll talk about the increase in food insecurity as we have seen during COVID-19, and then also have an example of some nonprofit organizations who have pivoted to be able to provide enough food or more food to people living in Austin. So thank you very much and we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.